Hello and welcome to Film Fla TV. Tonight we'll be looking at some of the features, shorts and documentaries being screened this week and talking to the people who made them happen. You'll see stories from the past and present, motorbikes, witches and a bit of music too. First, let's get out and about and find out what's happening around town. Alistair Fish can fill us in. Welcome to day five of the Galway Film Fla. I'm here at the beautiful Galmont Hotel where many of the masterclasses are taking place as well as the marketplace where films in production can find producers, editors and directors and potentially even feature at an upcoming Fla. The weather is absolutely stunning. I'm sure you can tell from the reflection behind me but that hasn't stopped audiences coming in their droves to see all the fantastic films at this year's event. Now since about 10 o'clock this morning we've seen some of the 108 short films being premiered at this year's um, FLA. A real focus happens at that time on young talent and Irish talent especially. Um, things stay going until at least 11 p.m. at night. In the afternoon and evening we switch our attention to features and documentaries and after many of them we get a behind the scenes look at how this is all done when we have Q&A's with directors, producers and even actors. Now speaking of behind the scenes it's also worth mentioning that the festival this year and every year is only made possible because of the hordes of volunteers who dedicate their time and energy to make it all possible. So a big thank you to them. This week is a celebration of film, but the FLA certainly does not turn a blind eye to the turmoil in the world around us. There are four films from Ukraine this year. Here's a taste of them and the thoughts of the Ukrainian people who are living here in Galway. I want to go to a big stage and sing with Chedraka. Why is it? Тому що щедрик робить людей добріше. My name is Alexandra Turova. I have a child. I believe in a family, Irish family. So beautiful family. Maybe this uh, is our, my and my child, grandmother, grandfather. <laughs> Very, very love this family. Very, very big thank you, Irish people, because now we have this. What When war started, uh, um, the, my job uh, was very dangerous and uh, I live from Ukraine, you know. I was a journalist in, in Ukraine and I investigated uh, uh, Ukrainian corruption. When war started, some people who I investigate looking for kill me, they prison me underground and I see two days underground. So yeah, this is, was very, very yeah, hard. I drive uh, here on the car with uh, my family, with my wife and three children. 3,000 kilometers, yeah. So long way, a very difficult way, yeah, but anyway, we are here, uh, this city and this uh, Irish people, uh, we, uh, we are loved them and uh, we made decision to stay here and live here, you know, so now we are here, yeah, and uh, don't want to go to any UK or somewhere else. And you know, uh, this city, is uh, change the people. Mm, I think uh, this is city uh, made us better. Friend, friend, yeah. you meet friend. I, I think friend, <laughs> okay. Irish and Ukrainian. A hundred years ago, this country was engulfed in violence. A number of films in this year's FLA reflect that by looking at the revolutionary period from the Easter Rising to the Civil War. Keepers of the Flame is a documentary about how families remember and sometimes confront a difficult past. It is a tragedy for people like myself brought up and living through a period of unrest and violence which all national struggles produce to explain actions which then seemed necessary and right. What is the truth? 
Is there a danger that memory will play tricks? It makes you think about the difference between history and memory. The film is um, about how both nations collectively remember events, in this case the War of Independence and the Civil War, or don't remember them, um, how the passage of time affects how uh, they remember, and how families remember events or don't remember. So it's about memories that are suppressed, memories that become myths in families, myths in the collective memory, and the role of, say, in this case, an archive uh, plays in, in that process. Archives provokes emotional responses, and they're able to challenge big narratives, like a national narrative that's been transformed, politicized, all the things you want, but family narratives as well. Uh, the opening up of a particular archive, it has a very dull name, it's called the, uh, the um, Irish Military Service Pensions Archive, but it is a treasure trove of um, material. These are applications made by people who fought in the War of Independence initially and then in the Civil War on both sides for a pension in regard to what they had done during the war. Um, so as part of that process they had to give an account of themselves uh, and what they had done and be very precise about the details of that. Um, so they obviously never intended for those documents ever to be seen. It wasn't, this is, you know, opened in 1924. And so those archives were digitised and made accessible to the general public about 10 years ago. And that's what inspired the film. She had this gun in a lovely sort of uh, Ormolu chest in her house. Um, but we never, I never thought about the violence. You couldn't talk to those whom you loved. You didn't tell your spouses and you didn't tell your children. So in fact, you were living in a certain box of isolation. The Civil War is the moment when betrayal becomes an active idea in Ireland. This is brother against brother. This is a root splitting apart. For individual people, it does a, a great service because a lot of the generation in between the third generation and the first generation never spoke about it so the children their children never knew what they had done because it was a civil war because there were people on both sides in the in their communities in the families they didn't want to talk about it they wanted to just put clear blue water between them and the events so this helps with that that um, and also if the state ever tries to manipulate the narrative the evidence is there to either contradict it or confirm it Oh, you have an uncle who died for Ireland and oh you know I'd be so proud if I had an uncle and I really thought I'm not so sure. Even at that age I was deeply skeptical of the cost of martyrdom. I think Irish people are very interested in the past. I mean there are, I think there are particularly colonized nations like ours we have an interest in our past because we were defined by whatever the colonizer said about us so we were defined by being the colony of an imperial power so once we became independent uh, we, we were on a mission to actually and in fact the war of independence was fought culturally as well as politically and militarily around the issue of identity so I think in Ireland that I can't see in the short term or even in the midterm um, any sign that, that there will ever not be an appetite for that. We need those archives not just in Ireland but everywhere and we need those archives in order to try and come to some approximation of an understanding of who we are. Now to one of the leading lights of the Galway Film Fla, Kate O'Toole has been central to its success from the very beginning. She's a former chair of the Fla and has quite a few stories to tell. Our very own Daniel Whitehouse caught up with her. What do you think it is about the Galway Film Fla that separates it from others? Galway? <laughs> you know, being on the very farthest western edge of Europe. It's unique. Um, yeah, I think very much the geography and the location has a lot to do with it. And of course, it influences personality as well. So that includes our Galwegian audiences and Galway people running the show. And uh, I think that's what gives it its special feeling. You know, I was down in um, Skull not long ago at Fastnet, which is a very small, small but beautifully formed little festival. And everybody there is, again, again, it has its own quality. All, every film festival has its own personality. And the Fastnet is lovely. And, but people were all saying, oh, it's like Galway was at the beginning. 
Oh, really? Yeah, that's what people were saying. Because, of course, we've grown since it began. We're now Oscar credited and all that kind of thing. Um, but before any of that happened, it was small and warm and friendly. And I do believe we've kept the warmth and the friendliness, definitely. So are there any favourite memories from, uh, from the history of the film, Fla? Um, I remember when there was a beer tent outside the Cladder Palace. This is before the Town Hall Theatre, or long before the Palace as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was this beer tent and it was always raining and it was, felt like it was in the middle of a muddy field. And I remember going in there after a screening and being rugby tackled to the ground by a very drunken actor who shall remain nameless. But, you know, I put one foot inside the tent and the next thing I was on my back with my head sticking out the flap at the side in about two inches of mud. So that was my... I think that was my first time in the beer tent. And that's the favourite memory, a, is it? Well, it was a baptism of mud. I don't want to hear about your least favourite then. <laughs> so just in terms of... Um, the Irish language films that are on offer this year, how important is it to, to have them in the film flat? Extremely important. Um, I introduced and did the Q&A with the writers and directors of Rocha and Frank yesterday. I, I believe great you had them in. Yeah. Yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah, I think it's extremely important. Mm. And how do you think the, uh, the landscape is looking in Ireland in terms of filmmaking at the great. moment? Great. Yeah. Absolutely great. I'm an actress. I've been very busy. I just finished doing a TV drama based in England and because of the tax breaks here and the financial incentives it was actually cheaper for them to fly all their British actors over and put them up in hotels to film here. So it's healthy, it's very busy. It's looking good. Yeah it is. And is there any uh, particular new talent that you are keeping an eye out for and that you'd like, you'd like us to know about? No. <laughs> Everyone? No, no, nothing new. No. Nope. Sorry. <laughs> okay, that's no problem at all. Um, so thank you very much, Kato Tool. Thank you. Thanks. So how do you like the idea of driving a motorbike across the freezing landscape of Siberia? The road is ice and the temperatures are minus 40 degrees. Two Irishmen have done just that and, well naturally, made a film about the experience. One mile down Siberian scramble has been quite a journey and it came to Galway this week. Right in the middle of the world, on the biggest, wildest frontier. I need to find so out. I'm a company director of a resourcing, uh, uh, recruitment resourcing company based in Dublin. Uh, that's for my day job and in my spare time in a, I'm an overland adventurer. So a couple of, um, there, there's like a good cohort of people in Ireland that travel across the world for fun. And we do it just for no other reason. And there was a couple of us, myself and a guy called Declan McAvoy, had been in Siberia independently. And we saw like Baikal and we thought, wouldn't it be cool to drive on the ice the full length of the lake because people locally drive across it, you know, for fun and for, for work. So the idea was born in 2018. 2019 was the prep. 2020 we set off to break two world records. So we hold, we're, we currently hold two world records. The first one is for the longest drive on ice uh, in seven days. And the second one is a group of international riders together from Argentina, Germany, Ireland, UK, and uh, Lithuania, and they hold the longest record for motorcycle ride on ice. Hello, my name is Mariano Carloni, and I'm from Argentina. I'm Fritz Kreis from Germany. My hometown is Hemsbach. Part of the part of the the plan was we we all knew so many people from all over the world, and we wanted to bring a group together from all over the world just to show like what adventure travel is about for different perspectives. So. Declan McAvoy knew Mariano and yeah. Mariano had helped him on the side of the road in Argentina. As I said, we met Fritz in 2014 on another trip where Fritz and his friend were driving a, a non-modified, unmodified mini around the world and we were doing another, another trip and literally all these relationships have been just built out of yeah. chance meetings. Yeah. Those Argentinians aren't very strong. <laughs> no, I, I left, so this was in February, right? So I left Argentina with 24, 22, maybe 24 degrees. Argentinian summer. Yeah, Argentinian summer. And then 24 hours, I was on the lake at minus 25, minus 30. So it was a big difference. difference. So cold was the tough part, yeah, that's for sure. 
What was the toughest for you, Fritz? The toughest for me, for me, was my cold feet. Oh, <laughs> really? Remember. It was so cold. Yeah, it wasn't, you weren't worried about crashing through the ice and dr drowning in one mile of freezing cold water. It's just yeah. hands and feet. Oh. It's, it's <laughs> amazing feet. actually how everybody yeah. thinks you should be super afraid and all this. But really, when you're in a situation like that and your fingers are paining you, all of, all, of your, all of your energy is in your fingers. It's in your finger, yeah, that's it. You don't you are get not to thinking think about on the cracks, you are not thinking on nothing else. Nothing, nothing else. else. But just trying to think in something different so you can deal with it. I have another job, but yeah, I've been banking for almost maybe 15 years. And so yeah, I love it. He's got a nice job. Yeah, I got a nice job, yeah. <laughs> you, Fritzi? I drive more than 30 years, maybe 30. Oh, 35 10, years. Only 10. Ten. Ah, only 10, I forget. Old, I'm 29. Yes, 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 yes I forget. <laughs> he started when he was 19, now he's now 29. Yeah, yes. You're not that old. Fritz. Now I'm 29 plus tax. <laughs> Fritz actually is a cloud expert. He loves clouds. <laughs> I think, favorite bike move. I think that the long way up, right? Yes. Oh, long way, long, long way around. Oh, long way around, yeah. Long yeah. way around, definitely. Ah, I suppose, yeah, actually. Yeah, it's a good one. For me, it was a great escape with Steve Steve. Nah, McQueen. yeah, but... Yeah. Did it, yeah. Fritz? I don't know. I'm not a liar. I think my own one. <laughs> <laughs> on the helmet, yeah, yeah, well, on the helmet. One this is, down. for me, is the best. Or, or from Kevin. Kevin's also very oh, yeah. nice, the movies. Yeah? yeah, sometimes you watch clips from other adventures and You've ridden through something like that yourself, and you're you're reliving somebody else's perspective. And to be honest, they're a bit addictive. Yeah, they are. Yeah, Filmmaking isn't all about producers, directors and actors. Cinematographers also play a huge part in the look and the feel of the pictures. We spoke to Colin Mullen about his work on The Troubles, A Dublin Story, which is set after the death of hunger striker Bobby Sands in 1981. City at the news of Bobby Sands' death. There is a house in New Orleans Here called the ride so my name is Colin Mullen and uh, I'm a cinematographer, uh, an educator and I work in youth arts. I'm from the dock and I'm delighted to be here to present um, with, with the team uh, The Troubles of Dublin Story and um, everyone that was involved just knew we had to see it to the end in a sense to get through it and we really wanted to make sure the film was realised and the vision of the director was realised, Luke, uh, uh, um, uh, Luke Canlon. So it was a lovely, lovely, lovely to get to the end of it, really. You know, it was almost three years from re reading the script initially, to be honest. And it's lovely to hear that there is interest in it, and it's getting nice, you know, kind of nice uh, comments about it. Um, so you know, yeah, that'd be great, you know, that it has the, I suppose the, you know, the recognition that I think it deserves because it was, you know, it was a labour of love for everyone. Really, they believed in the project and really wanted it to succeed. You know, so. So hopefully, hopefully it does. So I'm delighted now. We've actually sold out tonight, which is which is wonderful to hear. Yeah, so it's great. We had a great production designer. So I mean, working with a production designer and art department, and just having all the resources also to even have the cars and and the costumes and everything. So it's not just the cinematography aspect of it that brings that to life, and also even in the color grade, it was to you know to plan and a wonderful colorist. Um, from Helsinki, actually, and he's just got such an instinctual, um, you know, a brilliant uh, instinct for really getting the right era, if you like, and we work together to create that. But in terms of the shooting style, I like I shoot. I suppose I have a particular style. I use a lot of handheld camera work. I shoot my shoulder mostly, um, not not all the time, but I mean for this film, I did. So it's very fluid. I look to open up the film space, if you like. So it's, I don't really shoot a lot of coverage. It's kind of like if there's, I keep the camera connected a lot with the characters, and I kind of try and feel what is happening in the scene, and respond to that. So you know, I, I don't really shoot like a traditional, you know, shot close-up for a shot kind of thing, because uh, I think it, it can interfere sometimes with performance as well, where you're stopping all the time and restarting. But it, um, but we had huge support from all around the this, this sort of four neighbouring streets, if you like, Union Street, Chapel Street, Brampton Street, and New Street. So, uh, like, we, we needed a street to replicate Belfast the day after Bobby Sands' death. So, 
So this particular street was just perfect. It shoots, like it went to research, obviously, all the archive material, see what it looked like, what the houses looked like, and so on. And, and we brought in, like, you know, like a tank and army uniforms and army people. And, uh, and essentially had all the people from the local, all the kids from the street and everyone all, you know, um, uh, like my daughter's friends and everything, they were all in and they were all just in it as extras, you know, so it was really wonderful and that, and that, and that, that was all supported with the, with the town council and, and, and the local community, so it was wonderful. And the other locations, uh, well, well, they were actually, like, uh, it was, I think it was a reenacting group that were part of that, that, that supplied some of the all, the, all this, all the outfits and everything, you know. So it was brilliant and, and then we shot mostly then in Dublin aside from that, so it was great to have that connection of actually bringing some bring the production down, you know, to Dundalk to shoot it locally. Um, so that, that was wonderful, yeah. He's on the drum. A festival like this does not happen without a huge effort by hundreds of people, many of them volunteers. There are all kinds of people from all kinds of places, but of one thing in common, a love of film. For the first time since 2019, the Galway Film Flaw is back in person. And behind the scenes, cinemas like the Palace are feeling the excitement. It's great. It's really, really good. It's so nice to see the, the buzz back in the building and um, see everyone kind of come back in, in their droves to, to enjoy the flaw altogether. It's great. It's really, really good. I think one of the... The best way to describe it is uh, very fun chaos. Every, like, not in the sense that you know things are crazy, but like there's such a, a rush of energy throughout the building for like ten solid straight hours. For Hannah Day, former manager at the Palace, that excitement is helped by the tireless work of the team organizing the FLA. The FLA team make it so easy for us. Um, so I feel like managing the FLA is actually just me getting to come and have a really fun, like, atmospheric week at work. It's great. The spine of that team is formed by an army of volunteers, such as Michelle and Devonis. Um, there's a lot of sending people to different areas, a lot of moving people to their seats, checking tickets, all that sort of stuff, and then cleaning the screenings in between. Um, and I get to sit in and watch a few of the shorts as well, which is nice. It's like, it's like a normal thing. You just go in, you get a shirt, you get a the tag and it's your job. You talk to a lot of people, a lot of people to hear a sound, you just talk about films or whatever. It's a good time. The results of that hard work are clear to Ushin McDonough, an usher at the Palace. Only a few days into it so far and we've seen more people than we've seen here in, uh, I'd say the rest of the month. Um, great weather for us uh, and I think people are just really eager after the last two years to have a chance to get out and watch films again and meet people and uh, a lot like I said there's a lot of first-time people who have never been to Palos before and they're really taken with their unique building and I mean we're the only cinema in town where you can legally drink. The crowds and excitement contribute to memorable moments that you can only experience at the Galway Film Club. One that stands out to me from a couple of years ago is um, the drummer and the keeper. I saw that down at the town hall. And it's a great film, I absolutely loved it. Uh, but I think, and this is maybe one of the special things about the FLA, it's like, the film was great, I really enjoyed it, but it was the Q&A afterwards that just took it to a whole other level. It was, it was, um, it was a really lovely moment, a lot of people sharing their stories and um, people who'd kind of connected to the film and, and felt seen in that film, sort of telling their stories um, and having that kind of feedback with the cast and the crew that were there. And it was just such a lovely moment. So I think, yeah, that's the one that sticks out to me. Next, we have a spooky story about witches, magic, evil spells and college life. York Witches Society is a new feature from Connemara-based director Lisa Bolton. She had a chat with Daniel Whitehouse. It hasn't been easy for you all this moving around. Now is your chance to form some real bonds. The York Witches Society. We think you'd make a great So, we're here with Lisa Bolton, director of York Witches Society. Hello and welcome, Lisa. 
Hi, thanks How for are you? Me. I'm good, I'm happy to be here. Good stuff. So, initially, just if you want to tell us about the film. Sure, yeah. Um, Witches is about eight young women at a college stroke university who um, have this secret society that they, you know, they get together and they um, do these ritualistic things. They are not witches. But they um, unwittingly invite somebody to join them who it turns out is a witch. And um, so they unleash this um, historical presence and then they have to fight it off. What's the tone of the film going for? Is it a serious horror or is there lighter elements? I like to call it a fun horror. It's not comedy. I mean, it's, it is quite serious, you know, people die. It's, it's not a slow, uh, contemplative horror. It's a fun, I would say it's kind of like a fun, nostalgic horror. With the conception of the idea, are you interested in the occult and magic? Is, was that something you were drawn to? No, no. no. But I am interested in um, supernatural. And I think all my films have this kind of supernatural element to them. So when I got the chance to shoot something with witches, thinking, okay, now for some research and um, bring a good you know, dollop of supernatural into it. And what were the kind of things that you were um, researching, like, was it, was it films and literature? Um, some literature, but um, mostly films, to be fair. Um, what kind of films? Oh, gosh. The craft. Yeah. Um, Ouija, although I know it's not witches, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, yeah, anyth anything that felt even a bit witchy or had a similar tone mm. to the film. Yeah. yeah. Alistair Crowley, maybe, or Suspiria as well? Oh, Suspiria, both Suspiria, the old yeah. and the new. Um, yeah, very smitten by that. So, yeah. Uh, you talked about the, your other films having a, a supernatural edge. Was there a difference in approach that you took to this film? I suppose the, a big difference for me with this film was it's very much in studio. So, um, normally my films are external and they're very landscapey, and but this was the first film that I did which was almost completely in the studio even though in when you see the film we're in the woods and um, yeah we had a few external locations but that was a big thing for me to shoot a studio film so how does that play into it like are, are there problems that arise with just shooting in the studio or is that you know much more beneficial to shooting um no there are problems i think because you you can't just leave the door open for example, you know, <laughs> and um, you got to thinking all the time about the windows and where you're positioning people and um, but on the plus side, you get all that control of the studio, you know, and um, even some of our external sequences are filmed in the studio, which meant we could control the weather and um, as a safety thing as well, you know, makes makes it easier to control. Now, uh, have you been to Galway Film Flab before, either, you know, premiering something or just as a spectator? Yeah, I have. I actually had a film in the FLA, I think now, probably five years ago, a short film, because I made a film that won um, the first Galway 48-hour film challenge. Oh, wow. It was a comedy called The Postcard, and um, part of the prize was your film was shown in the FLA. So that was like a real bonus for me. And will you be here for long? Or are you just here to, to screen the film or will you be sticking around to see the buzz? Definitely sticking around. Yeah, I've got stuff on all week. So very excited. Got things booked every day, particularly the shorts. I'm really keen on the shorts. And um, I saw some shorts this morning. It just <laughs> blew me away. So I love, I love to, yeah, to sit in there and watch the whole program. Amazing. I mean, that's the, what it's all about, the buzz. Absolutely. OK, yeah. well, thank you very much, Lisa Walton. Not everything is all about film this week. The streets of Galway are alive with all sorts of sights and sounds. As usual though, pride of place goes to the buskers.
traveling musician or? Uh, yeah, a lot of the time. Um, I've been traveling around Ireland for the last year. I'm now kind of based in Galway, but I'll always go down to Cork, Waterford, Limerick, Kilkenny, up to uh, Donegal and all. Even even back home to Belfast as well, you know. Who inspires me? Oh, the, well, I listen to everything from like John Mayer back to Stevie Ray. Um, Uh, just uh, I love Ireland and the mood they have, so we wanted to do a round trip, and Galway was one of our of our step. I mean, in this trip, I love the mood. Everybody's so happy. I love the music, which is everywhere. So it's it's great for me. I mean, I I am into music a lot, so for me it's like dreaming. Cafe and a quartet, it's like gypsy jazz, a nice sort of thing. I don't know, it's a nice sort of, it's a nice wee hotspot in it for tunes and art and stuff, films and characters. Well, that's it for now from Film Fat TV. We'll be back tomorrow evening where it's awards night, so do join us then. Slango fall!